Today, we have Eric Bach on the podcast. He's a physique and fat loss expert for athletes, helping you look great naked without living in the gym. Eric is the creator of the Look Great Naked Protocol, which has over 1,100 success stories. He's been featured in media outlets like Schwarzenegger.com, Bodybuilding.com, T Nation, DrJohnRusson.com, Roman Fitness Systems, the Personal Trainer Development Center, CNN, Yahoo, Men's Fitness, among many others. Eric himself stays in incredible shape as a father, husband, and business owner. All you have to do is take one look at his social media and see the type of shape he's in. He's someone I've known, uh, I've both known and followed for a long time and an overall great guy. Eric, welcome to the show. Luke, thank you so much for having me. I um, appreciate the wonderful introduction. Absolutely, man. And and yeah, Eric and I uh, you know, know each other as well. We're in a similar coaching group and have been working on uh, some accountability measures to, to keep each other accountable too. So, um, so far, so far, so good. We haven't, uh, we haven't had too many, too many off days. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Even coaches need coaches, right? That accountability, you know, keeps us going the right direction. Exactly. For sure. So, yeah. So I want to get into uh, your background a little bit, because I you know, think that's always important to understand where people are coming from. So why don't we start with, you know, from the beginning, like everyone looks at you right now, they're like, hey, he's this rip fit guy. But, you know, obviously it wasn't always that way. There is a, a story and a journey that that's led to that. So what were things like growing up and how did you get into fitness? Yeah. And fortunately, I grew up in a family that was active. Sports were always a big piece of what we did. Um, I remember being a little kid, seeing my dad with his weight sets. Um, he used them occasionally. Um, he was also in martial arts. So I would see him come home. Maybe we'd be watching TV, but he'd just do push-ups or he would be stretching out. And now as a father, that's something that really imprints on me because I wanted to be like that. I didn't always listen to what he said, but I modeled what he did. So I had that good foundation in the beginning. However, when I was, especially when I was young, especially elementary school, going into middle school, moved around quite a bit as a kid. And so I was really, I was shy and I wasn't always comfortable in my own skin. Um, especially I recall in sixth grade, I was actually overweight for a while. And I remember being teased on one occasion and just how it made me feel really inconsequential. I just felt terrible about myself. I didn't really know anybody either because I just moved to that school. And that was a, really the first time I could really feel a lack of confidence in myself and being judged by my appearance. And that was something that really stuck with me. And fortunately, having a family that was active, I started doing things about it, right? I, was, I would exercise at home, just do some small things here and there, even though I didn't really know what I was doing. But that kind of laid the, pa the, the path for what would really become my career and a huge passion for me later on. Fast forwarding a little bit off of that, I was loving, you know, the framework of exercise and training consistently. And, you know, I pick out these different magazines that I would see and, and, you know, looking at my favorite athletes and all this stuff. Right. So it was very entertaining to me. I thought it was the coolest thing. I love action heroes, all that cool stuff that, you know, little boys <laughs> tend to like. However, when we started getting into sports, when we got into high school, I was the last kid that grew. I remember looking at my high school football program a couple of years ago when I was five foot two, 103 pounds when I was 14, right? And so everybody had taken off on their growth spurt. And even though I had worked hard and exercised and done a lot of these things, here I was again, just weak, tiny, nothing I could do about it. And I remember this one particular football, uh, football practice. I was playing special teams. Um, a guy took a kickoff return and I was the last man in the way. And he had a choice. He could either outrun me because I didn't have an angle or he could plant his foot and run through me. He ran through me. And at that point, it felt like an all-time low. I never felt so inconsequential as if I didn't matter. Um, I provided less resistance than the blades of grass he could have been able to have on his way to a touchdown, right? And so at that point, you know, I was, I was just in a, in a rough spot personally, right? And I was walking off the field, you know, I was getting a little trash talk, some of that stuff, which will happen. And my coaches actually saw just kind of my body language. And one of them grabbed me after practice and said, hey, let's come to the gym with me. Like, let's work on a couple of things. And at that point, you know, I'd played with weights, but no real structure. But we started doing things like deadlifts. And we started working in the bench press. And we started working into power cleans and snatches and Olympic lifting. And pretty soon, I was in the gym every single day with a plan, with a coach. And yeah, even though it took my body time to mature, mentally, I was focused on the process. I was focused on the basics. I was focused on getting stronger. And so once my body actually caught up, well, then I had the work ethic that had all these other things that I needed and really, you know, became a good athlete, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, started building muscle, feeling great. I can see how my life transformed physically and more importantly, mentally. And the habits that I learned through the gym 
really set the foundation for every other area of my life. So fast forwarding past that, unfortunately, I had a kind of a rash of different injuries that, um, you know, did not serve me, you know, directly and was looking to play football in college, but that was not really in the cards, um, especially, you know, a couple of weeks in, had retorn a hamstring that I tore out of the high school senior. And pretty soon I'm like, hey, what's my passion? And it was, it was training. It was always being in the gym because those same lessons that I had learned from being active and from preparing for sport transformed my life and my mindset in so many different ways. Right. And so being able to get that dialed in and being able to transfer it over into a passion, something I could do professionally, laid the foundation from that point. Got it. So, yeah, quite the journey for you. So started from being undersized, like having that moment on the football field where you kind of got run over. So j- just curious, like it sounds like your journey kind of really started from having a mentor, like you had a coach who pulled you aside. If you hadn't have like a coach who pulled you aside there, do you think like that was really the the turning point for you in your kind of athletic career was actually having like someone reach out to you and, and physically say, Hey, I'm going to help you. Yeah, that was it. You know, I mean, left to my own devices, I would just be dicking around with my classmates, doing some curls, doing bench press and having no guidance. Right. And you know, that might've done a few things for me, but it wouldn't have nearly had the impact that it did. And because I had somebody that gave me a clear cut path, to really cut through, you know, all the bullshit that's out there, it was so much easier for me to get results, right? Because as a kid, you know, I mentioned I'd like all these different magazines, I'd have men's health, I'd have muscle and fitness, and I would like, you know, rip out this workout and I would try this thing at the YMCA, you know, or go through something like that. But hey, little did I know that most of those programs were made for, you know, doped up bodybuilders at that point, and I didn't need 17 types of curls to build my arms. I probably needed to learn how to do a few chin-ups first. And so I was just throwing stuff at the wall and hoping something would stick. And frankly, it's still what I see a lot of people doing now on social media. They pick a workout off of YouTube and their effort and their ambition is in the right place. They just simply don't have the guidance to guide where that effort goes. And they're incongruent with, you know, the specific goal that they want and what their training looks like. For sure. I, I agree completely. So you were 5'2", 103 when you were 14. So you were a freshman at that point? Yeah, freshman at that point. Actually, that was into my sophomore year too. Okay, so that was I, it, it, Sophomore year, you were hundred, basically like 103 pounds. What were you by the end of high school? Um, about 5'9", 165, and I was power cleaning 315. Whoa, okay. So you went from being, in literally two years, you went from 103 pounds. I mean, I'm sure part of it was the growth spurt, but you basically went from yeah. 103 pounds to gaining basically like 60 pounds. Like, there had to be something aside from lifting. Like, was your, did your nutrition change? Like, like how did how did you change your lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, in terms of my lifestyle, um, fortunately I had always like, you know, mostly fruits and vegetables and, and, and stuff like that. And we had good quality food at home, which was great. Um, and frankly, you know, I enjoyed cooking actually when I was a kid. So my mom would always actually allow me to try some different things. I mean, I loved like barbecue. Right. So like, I remember I had an allowance when I was like, you know, when I was a kid growing up and at one point I'd actually bought like a recipe book for like how to make really good barbecue. So like I would make these different seasoning rubs and blends and I actually still use them today. So that was a really cool introduction. Like I had a really supportive family for anything that I wanted for, for health and wellness space. And of course I didn't really want to listen in some aspects, but you know, now reflecting back in my mid thirties and, and having a daughter, it's like, I can see how important that structure actually was. And it doesn't mean that everybody who has that structure is going to take it. Um, love my brother to death, but we have very different lifestyles when it comes to health. Right. So it's kind of a classic case of nature and nurture kind of being a component there. However, like that foundation was really big. Um, but beyond that, you know, I talked to my coaches like, Hey, what should I be eating directly after my workouts? What should I be doing around it? And so they gave me guidance on what I should be doing. Like, what should I eat when I'm having school lunches? And really I was just re- avoiding a lot of refined sugars. Avoiding junk was really the biggest thing versus like trying to be perfect everywhere else. And that's the interesting thing about nutrition, right? There's a million different things you can implement when a lot of times nutrition is more about avoiding big mistakes than it is being perfect 90% of the time. Right. I love that. So you went from, you know, growing a lot, getting a lot stronger in high school. So after high school, what happened from here? Yeah. So, you know, I was preparing to play, uh, play college football, um, had a few injuries like in high school to our hamstring and then, you know, try to go back in, in, uh, when I was in college, a couple, you know, like a weekend to, uh, to college trying to play some quarterback, boom, I did it again. So at that point I'm like, listen, I know so many people that have played and it was a D3 level, which, you know, nothing against D3, but I wasn't getting school paid for. And I'm not the biggest frame guy naturally. So I didn't want to be having debilitating injuries, shoulders, elbows, knees, all that stuff that would prevent me from being able to play catch with my kids, you know, stuff like that. So at that point, 
um, I'd already decided I want to go into kinesiology and go into the strength and conditioning route. So, you know, when I was in college, I got involved actually with the sports teams really young. So I actually started doing some internships when I was 18, 19 years old, uh, both at like a local performance facility and then directly working under some of the sports teams. Uh, by the time I was, I think, 20, I was actually helping run the strength and conditioning program for the university wrestling team and running individual weight room sessions, so on and so forth. So early on, you know, I had my passion in the things that I really cared about when it comes to strength and conditioning specifically at that point. And so I really dove right into it, though, and just wanted to get that actual real world experience with it. So fast forward kind of through college, I left college, um, having published research with my CSCS, um, having experience working with collegiate level athletes and then running, you know, weight room sessions and all of that stuff, which was great. Um, had a chance to go do either some NFL combine training down at uh, Exos in, 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 I believe, Scottsdale. Yeah. Arizona, we'll move yeah. up to Denver. Yeah. But um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, um, she also got a job offer in Denver. So we moved out to Denver, Colorado and got great experience working at a facility called Forza. And Forza was owned by a strength coach of the Denver Nuggets. So right out of college, I was able to get some great experience working both in a world-class training facility in terms of like our clientele was, was excellent. Um, but on top of that, this was when the NBA players are coming out of a lockout. I was able to jump into the weight room with him, work specifically with some different NBA players and get them back to activity um, and really start to understand both the business side of things, but also the performance area. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there was a, an ownership change directly at that gym. And I learned pretty quickly that when you work a personal trainer, you do not dictate a whole lot when you're working for somebody else. And I learned pretty quickly that my clients, as awesome as they were in the gym, as soon as they would travel for work, hey, alcohol starts flowing, they're having business dinners, so on and so forth. And so I heard about this online training thing and had just started, you know, dabbling a little bit here and there and providing my clients with some workouts that they could do when they're in hotel rooms or in those different scenarios and cleaning up their diet when they're on the road. And pretty soon the online aspect of my business started building that foundation. And by the time Forza went through some changes directly with management, you know, I was building some recurring revenue and you know, I don't like the way that things are structured there. So I pivoted and I went even deeper into my performance roots because that's always what I wanted to do. I wanted to play football. I wanted to work with athletes. And I started working at a different facility where we did, you know, NFL combine training. We had world-class athletes in really every single sport you could imagine for multiple years. And that was land out performance. What, um, so what, that, uh, pause in one second. What year was this? Wow. What year was this? It was all very fast. Yeah. Um, that was probably 2015. Okay. Probably okay. 15, 16, 17. Got it. Okay. So just to get a timetable. So that was right. So you're working with, you know, NBA players and then you kind of pivoted to online. So you went, you started coaching people online in 2015. I started probably coaching people online in 2013. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not seriously. Just taking a few of my clients who were in the gym. My primarily focus was the people I had in the gym and the online aspect was actually in addition to support kind of the traveling and the lifestyle that they had in that regard. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So you were working with a lot of like high-end athletes. So how did, uh, yeah. So how did you get from like kind of where you were right, right there where you're kind of working with higher end athletes and now you kind of work with former athletes. So what, what's kind of been your trajectory since then? Yeah. So even going back to, to my days at Forza, I still have a few of those clients in my online coaching program now. And so many of those were executive businessmen specifically that were also working. So I, I had some athletes and I had some people who were businessmen. A lot of these businessmen also happen to be former athletes. And so, you know, as the business continued to mature and as I stepped away from these specific performance facilities, obviously, if I don't have a full-on performance facility, I'm not going to be able to cater to that elite clientele in terms of support performance as well as I could if I did have that facility themselves, right? Um, so I had rented out space with another gym, had been working directly with some of these clients. Former athletes were coming in for you know, more general fitness goals, wanting to build muscle, get leaner, but also be able to keep up some level of performance to be able to do the other things that they enjoy in life and work around injuries and, and so on and so forth. Right. And so the pivot was kind of gradual. It went from, you know, kind of a blend of, of you know, regular folks and businessmen and, and athletes to a lot of athletes and some business folks. And then it became more of a pivot towards older athletes, former athletes, and, you know, regular men and women who are looking to, to optimize their fitness. Right, right. So what would you say is the biggest difference between coaching some of the higher end athletes like, you know, NBA guys like college athletes to coaching yeah. the men and women who you do today? Yeah, so the perspective really needs to change in each case. 
when somebody is training purely for a performance aspect and their job is their body, everything that they do is really built around that aspect of it, right? So people like to glorify the workouts that they see. And most of the time what they see on social media or what they see on ESPN from like an athlete workout is like some tidbit of some crazy exercise that they're doing that the way that they train 99% of the time. But the perspective has to be, listen, if you have somebody who's an athlete, you can take some of the components of what they're doing. You can draw on some of the key principles like strength and power, but it has to be implemented differently. It has to be done much safer with lower risk and in addition, understanding that, you know, most of us, you can relate, you're a dad, you're a business owner, you know, and, you know, we're both both in our 30s. The body doesn't recover quite the same that it did at 22, like many of these athletes. Well, our recovery is going to be a lot less. Our entire life isn't built around getting enough sleep and optimizing nutrition. These are things that are important for sure, but it's not necessarily our income. And so when it comes to somebody who, you know, might want to be able to, to look athletic and to be able to have some of those qualities, but is not paid as an athlete, what you need to understand is like your ability to train as hard and as frequently is going to be less because all the other areas that pour into it, such as nutrition, such as sleep, such as recovery, such as, you know, proactive stress reduction might not be as much of a priority because you might be spending a lot more time with your family or on your career or in these other areas. And the biggest place that most people fall apart is having an imbalance between their training, between their nutrition, and then between their lifestyle. And if you approach training with the idea that you're going to train like an elite level athlete, you have to have all the other components. Otherwise, your body's going to break down. And that's the biggest misconception that people have. And when they enter that space without the right mindset, expectations are impossible to meet. And when expectations are impossible to meet, it's incredibly demotivating. That's why most people give up. That's why most people struggle. And so that's the biggest thing that I have to communicate clearly. Yeah, we can draw on different things like adding some explosive exercises like box jumps or broad jumps or a medicine ball throw. And we can occasionally dial in some heavy squats or deadlifts, but it can't be the same amount because that recovery isn't going to be the same. Right. Definitely a lot of differences and some similarities as well. So your obviously ideologies have adapted and adjusted over the years. So like, what would you say is kind of like your, let's say like you're getting a new client right now, like someone coming in who is maybe that avatar, like a former athlete, now a mom or dad who's, you know, not, uh, fitness isn't the centerpiece of their life, but they still want it to be a major part of their life. Yeah. Well, how does your protocol look like? Like, what do you do? Like when someone first starts with you, how do you look at their lifestyle? Take me through that. Yeah. So the biggest thing is fitness needs to improve your life. It can completely consume it. Right. And if you do that, it's going to enhance it, not detract from it. So that's the key mindset that you have to have coming in because many people who were athletes, many people who are maybe type A and motivated in different areas of their life, they're either all in or they're all out. And unfortunately, when you're all in or all out, the all out tends to win out. Right. And so the perspective has to be like, we're going to focus on what you can do consistently, not what you can do when conditions are perfect, because perfect does not exist. So in this case, a very common protocol for us, uh, we're talking four four workouts per week, about 45 minutes, you know, what we consider an upper lower training splits, so upper body one day, lower body the next. Um, that's going to be great because we can train mu muscle groups multiple times in the week. That's going to be great for building muscle or losing body fat. And the thing here is if you miss a workout because shit hits the fan in life, as it inevitably does at some point, you're still getting a good balanced training approach versus maybe doing a body part split where you train chests and then back and then arms and then legs, which everybody always seems to miss, right? Um, so that is a really good fail safe knowing that if chaos does happen in life, we're not going to have gaps in what we're doing in the gym. On top of that, nutritionally, right? Nutritionally, when I have somebody in, I do like to start with a fairly aggressive protocol. We call it our insulin reboot protocol. Um, and before jumping into that, I think it's important that the way I approach nutrition is everything is a tool, meaning sometimes you need a wrench, sometimes you need a hammer. I'm not one of those guys that says like you have to go all low carb or all keto or all intermittent fasting, any one of these things forever. However, what I find for most people, they have very poor insulin sensitivity. They have a ton of cravings. And right away, if we can help somebody reduce the number of cravings that they're having, reduce even just the nonstop thoughts about food with an intermittent fasting protocol, it's going to be a little bit lower in carbohydrates. It's going to help improve insulin sensitivity. It's going to help improve hunger cues. It's going to provide them a little bit more discipline in different areas of their life. And it's going to teach them that hunger itself is not an emergency. And so the first 30 days, we do focus on our insulin reboot protocol. Many times we see people drop in seven to 11 pounds within that 30 days. Some is glycogen and water, of course, uh, but a lot of times it's, it's body fat too, right? And that sets the foundation because that way, if somebody wants to focus on maybe building a little bit more lean muscle, they have better insulin sensitivity and they'll be able to add more lean muscle without getting body fat. If they want to be able to lose body fat, 
cool, we can make some adaptations to that insulin reboot protocol, start to add in carbohydrates or increase meal frequency. Because if you stick on something like that too long, and you've probably seen this a lot with low carbohydrate diets, stress goes through the roof. When stress goes through the roof, we're talking cortisol, and then thyroid function goes down and people hit fat loss plateaus. So you can do aggressive short-term diets, but you have to have a plan to be able to adapt out of it. Otherwise that's where you hit roadblocks. And so that's something I really have to, to walk people through in that process because and I'm sure you've seen it plenty of times, Luke, people do incredibly well for a short period of time. They hit that roadblock, but at that point, what they did work so well for them that they're so committed to it. They're almost married to this ideology that this is the only way that they can lose fat and anything else isn't going to work. And it becomes really hard to get buy-in. So that's kind of how we navigate that process of explaining what happens if you stick on a diet like this too long and how we navigate it properly to help you lose body fat and keep it off for good. So how did you, I, I love that protocol. How'd you come up with that? Did, is that something you implemented recently? Was kind of that 30 days focusing on the insulin reboot, intermittent fasting, or is that something that you've been doing for a while? Um, it's something that we've really, we doubled down on really about two years ago. Um, gradually, we had kind of shifted towards this as, as a practical ideology, right? And looking at the clients we tend to help, many of them, hey, listen, they don't want to track everything that they eat. They don't want to be toting around Tupperware and broccoli eating four or five times a day. I get it. I don't like it either. It sucks. Um, doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but for most people, it's not practical. And if it's not practical, it's not going to be sustainable and maintainable. So with that mindset, we need something that's simple, that's straightforward, that's going to get people some quick wins and improve their underlying health. And so for us, that was a very simple way to get the ball rolling for so many people. And it's been game changing, right? Like people are, are loving the process of it and they understand what we're doing and why and how we need to adapt though, instead of sticking with it long-term. Love it. So once someone goes through this reboot pr protocol for the first 30 days, like you said, they're, they're building habits. Where, where do you go with them from there? Like, how do you determine where you go with them from there with their, both their nutrition and their workouts? Yeah. So, you know, like coaching is cool because it's both data driven, but you also have to take the human element. So it's both an art and a science. So through our check-in process, we're very thorough. How are we doing in terms of stress, energy levels, cravings, sleep quality? Basically, if you're sleep, hunger, cravings, energy levels, mood swings, stuff like that. If you're having a lot of those, it's a pretty good sign that your cortisol is likely sky high. And hey, what happens when cortisol is sky high, when we're stressed out, but that's when we start to make reactive decisions. Sometimes that's people grabbing a drink, taking the edge off at night, just one night gap, right? Or it could be you find yourself elbow deep in a bag of Doritos. Once you put the kids down, you're walking, watching you know, Netflix, right? And so a lot of times those habits and behaviors happen reactively. And so for us, we really manage and look at what is happening on a week to week, even a day to day basis with our clients and look for those cues. Are we doing well? We're losing some body fat, but these things are manageable. Okay, good. But the moment that they start to trip and we start to slip up there, we need to either make some lifestyle adaptations to what they're doing, or we need to either start increasing meal frequency and or carbohydrate intake to provide a little bit more support for the rest of the body. Love it. So a couple of things that you talk about that not a lot of other people talk about, you know, what are sleep and stress management? Like a lot of people talk about, you know, it's workouts and nutrition, like maintain a calorie deficit, follow progressive yeah. stress training program. But you also talk a lot about sleep and stress management. Like why are those really important? Even if someone's goal is fat loss or, you know, muscle gain or body composition, why are sleep and stress management specifically as important as those things? Yeah. Listen, if you could bottle up the benefits of sleep and sell it in a pill, it would be the biggest grossing thing in the history of the world, right? Every single hormone function is going to be optimized with better sleep. If you check out the Chicago sleep study, five hours a night of sleep for five days for men can decrease testosterone levels by 20%. And how many people operate with five to six hours of sleep every single night and then wonder why they have no energy, why they feel like shit, why they can't lose body fat, why they can't build muscle? Well, in many cases, it's because that sleep aspect is completely out of alignment. And when we don't get proper sleep, you know, hormones, like I mentioned before, testosterone takes a hit. Growth hormone, which is our natural kind of youthful agent, helps with skin elasticity, recovery, joint health, right? That goes down because that's released during different periods of sleep at night. Furthermore, insulin sensitivity, how well our body can actually take and use the carbohydrates that we have. So sleep if you can manage to get one more hour per night, you're essentially improving every single physiological function in your body. And that's just the physical part. I mean, we can go into mental health, how well we consolidate, you know, memories, how well we can stay disciplined, how we can avoid, you know, cravings and stay in alignment with what we want to be. All of those things are improved with sleep. 
in sleep and stress are interrelated because when we're stressed out, often we can't sleep. When we can't sleep, we get more stressed out. So it's a very vicious cycle. And so, yeah, as a result, we really prioritize the sleep routines, things that you're doing before bed, proactive stress reduction with small things like daily walks and meditation. And those are really the inroads that help you dial in every other thing. And frankly, act more congruently with the person you want to be. And you probably see this a lot too, Luke, but so many times people feel like, like they're working really hard and they are in the gym and then they feel disappointed because they're not getting the results they should because they fall into self-sabotage and they beat themselves up mentally and pretty soon they can feel like nothing works no matter how hard they're trying. And it's really frustrating. But many times what it can come back to is how are we proactively reducing stress? How are we focusing on improving our sleep? Because if we can take care of those, the other pieces, you can do a lot more with less. And that's ultimately what most of us need with 25 hour days packed into 24 hour schedules. I love that. You know, I think you just said it right there. A lot of people are super busy and a lot of people listening right now are probably like, well, that sounds all good and well, Eric, but how am I supposed to fit in stress management? How am I supposed to sleep more hours? Like I'm already yeah. so busy. Like what are a couple quick things that people can do to decrease stress and improve sleep? Yeah, definitely. So a couple of things I recommend for my clients. One, try to go for a 10 to 15 minute walk in the morning, right around sunrise. I realize sometimes it's cold. I grew up in Wisconsin too. I totally get that, you know? Um, but what that's going to help do, that's going to help set your natural circadian rhythm. Once your eyes start to get that sunlight in, it really starts a clock and a timer inside your body. that says 16 hours later, we're going to start to decompress. So getting out and getting sunlight early in the day, ideally with a walk, is going to help set that circadian rhythm up for good, right? So that's going to be one big thing. Throughout the day, try to reduce stressful inputs. That's really the biggest thing, right? So if you're getting stressed out because you're always listening to the, to the news or um, you always have people in your life that are bringing you down, Frankly, it can be good to take time away from those things, to limit the inputs that you have, to consume less information, to spend less time on social media. And sometimes, again, instead of trying to add more to your schedule, like trying to fit in meditation, which is obviously great, but you're going to have better results by consuming less of the other things. And you're actually going to open up more time and more headspace. And so that's really the biggest thing that I like to focus on first. It's addition by subtraction. Another thing you mentioned there, I, I love what you said, by the way, another thing you mentioned there is meditation and something that I've heard you talk about. How long have you personally been meditating and what are the benefits that you found from meditation? Yes. Yeah, so meditation, I mean, tell you what, this is a tough one. This is a tough thing for me to stick with. Um, I'm a high energy guy. I want to go, go, go. And taking 10, 15, 20 minutes to really think about doing nothing is almost hearsay in the way that I'm naturally wired, but that's why I need it, right? And so the best way I can describe meditation is it gives you a second to pause before you react to something. How many times do we act and then we look back and we're like, oh shit, why did I do that? Oh shit, why did I eat that? Oh, why did I, you know, why was I cranked up and short with my spouse? Whatever the case. And what meditation does is it teaches you to have that short pause and that gap to think introspectively, what am I feeling and why? And that short pause can be enough for you to change your reactions to everything else. And it can help teach you that not everything's an emergency, that you are in control here and your thoughts are your thoughts. They're not your actions, right? And so that's a big thing with meditation. And for most people, listen, it can be as, like as easy as starting three to five minutes per day. Um, the Calm app is a great app. Headspace is a wonderful guided meditation. And I'm sure you can go on YouTube right now and find like, 85,000 different meditations, which maybe you don't want to do that because it's more information there. So maybe stick the headspace in the Calm app. Um, but those are excellent. Those are great ways to get a really good introduction with it. And for me, and for most of my clients, it's going to be starting early in the day. It's going to be the best with a meditation because listen, anytime you're trying to start something new, if you wait, chances are something else is going to pop up in your day. And it's going to be much, much harder to stick to it. So another thing I want to get into is your personal health routines. Cause you know, someone will look at you right now and you pretty much stay, you know, fit and ripped like year round. So what do you like, what is like a day in the life or a week in life of you look like in terms of your personal health routines to be able to maintain the shape and physique that you have currently, obviously, you know, you used to be, you know, just a single guy in your twenties, but now you're, you know, married yeah. you know, kids, like household business. So like people are probably wondering, like, well, how, how does he do that? So what, what are kind of your secrets or things that you do? Yeah. So the biggest thing, we'll talk nutrition first. Um, the biggest thing is I try to eat the same meals at least three times a day, right? So I use at breakfast, I generally have oatmeal with blueberries and then two eggs and some egg whites. Like that's 
you know, I'll, I'll have some basically eggs and oatmeal and with some blueberries in it. And I'll sit down and I'll actually eat that with my daughter. Right. So that's like a little pocket of time. I'm generally up around five. I do that with her directly. We have a great time. We relax and that provides an excellent foundation from there. Um, if I'm going to work out, you know, I have a banana and protein shake, something very simple can, can go on the, on the road at lunch. I always use a meal delivery service. It's something that saves me time. It saves me energy. It saves me decision fatigue. A lot of people look at you know, meal plans or meal delivery as something that's an extra expense. But the way I think about it is if I can pay $12 for this meal, which is going to be healthy, which saves me 10 minutes of preparation, um, probably more like 20 minutes of preparation, going through that entire thing, picking up the food. I mean, I'm saving 30 minutes a day on that easily. And to me, that's more valuable than, you know, trying to be perfect in terms of what I'm having um, in terms of like preparing ahead of time on my own, right. And doing the extra meal prep. So that's one aspect. And then dinner is something very simple and straightforward. Uh, fortunately, you know, my, my wife is active as well. And so very simple, generally it's a potato or it's, or it's rice, it's a vegetable and it's a lean source of protein, right? I've got a smoker. So I love to throw things in my trigger and have a great time. So a lot of chicken, uh, a lot of steak, a lot of pork. And so we just kind of cycle through different options like that. We have pizza every week. We have tacos every week and um, really make some room for the foods that we enjoy as well. So that's a big balance thing. So it's pretty much like three structured meals and then a snack, quote unquote, for, uh, for workouts. And that's how we stay dialed in. Um, the biggest thing is reduce decisions and that's going to make it easier to stick with it. Love it. So that's the nutrition piece. What yeah. does your training look like? Yeah. So my training. So, Hey, I take my dog for a walk right around six, six thirty, depending on when sunrise is every morning, um, get multiple walks kind of throughout the day. A lot of times they're going to be around meals. So I aim for 10,000 steps. That's a pretty kind of simple barometer for me. Beyond that, I'm in the gym four to five days a week. You know, I'll say five simply because I'll probably have one day where it has to be filming content, you know, additional, additional work like that. But, um, very similar to what I recommend for my clients. You know, upper lower split, we're training four days a week that are going to be 45 to maybe 60 minutes tops. Um, I don't do a ton of structured cardio based on my other activity that I'm going on between like walking the dog, chasing my daughter, so on and so forth. Um, it's not that it's not beneficial. It's just that, you know, unless I'm really trying to get extremely shredded, it's not going to be a big piece of what I do. Um, so the big, big thing there, it's like, listen, like success comes from a ruthless execution of the basics. I still jump. I still throw, do some of that stuff. Um, you know, I legged it a day. So I was squatting, doing deadlifts, basic exercises. And even when you look back at, you know, my time working with elite level athletes, people would be amazed. It's going to be a lot of squats, a lot of deadlifts, a lot of cleans, a lot of bench presses, a lot of pull-ups, a lot of dips, not all the crazy stuff you see on social media. Love it. How about as far as you, anything else, as far as like sleep or stress management that you haven't already talked about that you maybe kind of implement into your routines or other just general things that you do for your health? Um, you know, the biggest thing is the walking for me and disconnecting. Um, as you know, having an online business, you can literally be working all the time. And it's a big mindset battle for me to realize there's always work to be done, but it doesn't have to be done now, right? And so it comes with setting hard stops. And that's something you and I have kind of worked on. What time are we going to be off social media for our family, right? Like how are we going to disconnect there and how do we hold each other accountable to it? So that's a big thing. I'm setting deadlines when I have family time, single tasking, and then getting rid of those potential distractions beyond that. Right. It's like, how can we reduce the downside of those other aspects? And for me, listen, obviously being on social media and doing some of that stuff is crucial for work. But if I do too much of it, I can easily get lost and be in a reactive state. And it doesn't serve my health and it doesn't serve my family either. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, as Eric was talking about, those are some things that we've been working on as well. And, you know, that's one thing I've personally been working on is being off of my phone at night. Cause as Eric just mentioned, you know, and a lot of people I'm sure can relate when you have work in your mind all day and then trying to shut off at the end of the day. Sometimes the phone is addicting to just, you know, pick up and see all the, all the notifications and emails and everything, but yeah, it can definitely help to, to put it away for sure. That's exactly it. Love it. So, um, no, we're running, uh, run short on time here, but I do have a, a couple questions that I want to finish with. First of all, this has been, you know, really great. Um, appreciate you sharing. I'm sure everyone listening is going to have a lot of things to implement and, and to follow up on. So the first question I want to ask is, you know, people who like what you're saying, where can people find more about you? Yeah, easiest place, at Bach Performance on, I guess, every single social media app, which is probably what it would be, but uh, Instagram's probably the biggest one. Just drop me a message and saying, hey, you know, I, I heard, you know, heard you from Luke and, uh, and we can have a conversation from there. Love it. 
And we'll definitely post that in the show notes as well. And then the last question we always like to finish with is, let's say we're fast forwarding right now. It's the end of your life. You've achieved and accomplished everything that you've wanted to achieve. How do you want to be remembered when it's all said and done? I want to be remembered as somebody who made fitness practical, sustainable, and approachable. Something that improved people's lives, not consumed it. Because I think it's far too drawn out. People make it far too complex right now. And that creates a bigger barrier than people really need to improve health. Because health, it's a force multiplier. It'll bleed over and affect and improve every other area of your life if you do make it a priority. Love it. Love it. Well, appreciate all your insight today, Eric. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.